earlier this month, the Energy Department was left embarrassed after it made an error in the official fuel price adjustment for December. The price of petrol initially went up by 81 cents per litre, but the department retracted and said that this was overstated by 6 cents. The price was actually hiked by 75 cents. Since then, the Automobile Association has said that uh, there needs to be an urgent investigation into price increases, taxes and levies on fuel. Now, the department's Robert Marke explained how the miscalculation occurred. What happened is normally when you calculate the, the, the retail margin, it's called its own comfort composition. And one of the composition of the retail margin is the wages of the four quarter tenants. And that wages is, is adjusted every year in September. So this year we adjusted it in September, it was 5.7 cents a litre. Now, when we calculate the margin at the end of the year, you are supposed to then subtract that 5.7 from the total calculation, which is something that normally you, for example, what happened now, you find that you have done it in theory, but you didn't do it on paper. When people ask you, you said, no, it's done. Then we picked it up when we were updating the, the matrices, the breakdown for the service station cost and so on. That's when we picked it up. But no, there's an overstating of this margin. And then we checked with the retailers and so on. Then we corrected it. That's why you see the error term that was issued by the department. At the same time, Marcus sought to give reasons for this month's fuel increase. He said there are different influential factors that contributed to the rise in prices. The main contributing factors, as we have said, the first one is the, the rent dollar exchange rate, which was weaker compared to the with the rent was weaker compared to the US dollar and contributed to the higher prices, slightly higher oil prices. Uh, another factor is the increase in the slag levy of about 26.3 cents, and then these margins that we're talking about that are adjusted every year once off in December. So they are also included in the adjustment. That's why you see the increases that you see. In January this year, the price of 93 unleaded fuel was 14 rands. Today, you are paying around 20 rands for unleaded fuel, the highest ever in South African history. In January this year, the price of 93 unleaded fuel was 14 rands. And today, as I said, you're paying 20 rands for that same litre. That is a 40% increase within 12 months. Now, in light of these figures, calls are mounting for an investigation and a review into the price increases, taxes and levies uh, uh, on fuel. And uh, to unpack this further, we're joined now by Automobile Association spokesperson Leighton Beard, IFP National Spokesperson Mkulegwa Shlema, Economic Researcher at Solidarity uh, Union, uh, Tians de Bosson, and Outer CEO Wayne Dubenage. To be a part of this conversation tonight, send us uh, your WhatsApp questions and comments, 72 What are we being taxed for that we do not benefit from? That's a question we will put to our panel, but uh, let's hear your views as well tonight on the makeup of our high fuel prices. Later, let's begin with you. It's not the first time that you are calling for a recalculation and an audit of the elements that make up our fuel price, but the answer this time around as you make the call is that we don't think it is necessary to audit the makeup of our fuel price. In fact, the uh, department saying there are many other players who monitor crude oil on a daily basis, so if we were doing something unbecoming, they would also pick it up, but also they are saying there are independent auditors who audit these calculations. So why call for an audit? What's your response to that? Uh, I don't think we've accused anybody of doing anything unbecoming at all. I think it's just a question of looking at the fuel price and how it impacts on consumers and saying, is there a way we can mitigate against these rising costs? Uh, I think to suggest that we are saying that there's something untoward is probably a little disingenuous. What we are calling for is a review of the fuel price with a view to seeing whether all the elements that are currently on the fuel price are still necessary, whether they're still appropriate for South African conditions, and whether there's any of those components that we can uh, perhaps relook at in terms of pricing uh, and determine whether there's a better way of formulating the fuel price at the end of the day. I think the bottom line for us is, is um, why can't we do it? It's not an exercise we think is going to take excessively long time to complete. Uh, and at the end of it, if it's transparent, it will allay the fears of many millions of South Africans about rising fuel costs. So um, we're not suggesting for any moment that there's anything uh, untoward with the fuel price in terms of uh, somebody doing something shady. 
We just think that there's a better way perhaps of calculating it. And what we are saying is let's take a look and see if that's possible. Yeah, we'll get a little bit in, into that in, in a moment. But um, Kulego, you've made a call to the uh, Speaker of Parliament, which was rejected, to have a debate uh, on this particular matter of uh, the uh, elements that make up the fuel price. Why do you think that call was rejected? Well, it was a regrettable rejection, really, because the reasoning of the um, Speaker was that the matter could be addressed in other debates. You know that tomorrow... Um, the budget and the appropriation bill will be before the House, before Parliament rises tomorrow afternoon. But we fundamentally believe that this matter needs and requires its own urgent separate attention. Key factor, of course, is the fact that almost 33% um, of the fuel price is part of the general um, levy and the um, road accident fund levy. So <clears throat> the call of the IFP really is that at this point in time, given the volatile economic situation for the majority of our people, particularly the poor, um, and the impact that this fuel price has in so far as the cost of transportation is concerned and on food amongst others, is that the fuel levies um, must be suspended until such time that there is an improvement in the socioeconomic conditions um, of our people. This, of course, must run parallel to the fact that there has to be a review. South Africa is one of the very few countries that charges such um, levies and taxes on fuel, and we fundamentally believe that it is fast increasing having an adverse effect um, on the daily lived conditions and daily lived realities of our people. So it is a matter really that requires um, urgent attention. And we believe that um, the speaker erred in the judgment that she made um, in that this debate should not proceed because we need to actually have the Department of Minerals and Energy and National Treasury amongst us, and I'd imagine social development as well, to have a fundamental look at what this is doing. And so that is why the IFP is of the firm view at this point in time that in the collective interests um, of the people, um, the fuel levies must be suspended with immediate yeah. effect. Just the fact that you at 20 brands per liter um, of fuel at this point in time, think about the people taking taxis, yeah. um, commuting to and from work and so on. Yeah. Those prices of travel are bound to increase. And of course, they're not getting pay increases either. And the mismanagement of the road accident fund amongst others and the general corruption that's taking place in South Africa means that we, citizens are through their poverty are still funding this corruption. Yeah. High volatility of fuel prices, a permanent feature, I suppose, uh, one would even say in the in the global economy. In fact, uh, one of the responses from uh, uh, the Department uh, of Mineral Resources is that record prices are also happening in other jurisdictions like Singapore, like like Australia. And this has got pretty much to do with the fact that the price of crude oil has doubled in the last 12 months. Hence, we are paying 40 percent more uh, for unleaded fuel in South Africa this time uh, around. Uh, Wayne Divinage, uh, are there taxes that we are paying that we are not benefiting from? Yeah, I, th I think uh, the AA's call to scrutinize um, what's going on here is, is a valid one. Uh, you know, the 11 components above, uh, 12 components that make up the fuel price, and, in, and only one of them is subjected to international uh, oil prices. That's the basic fuel price and the uh, rand dollar exchange rate. The rest are internal taxes. And I think it is a bit about time, uh, as Tito Mbueni was calling for a while ago, uh, a, a uh, you know zero-based budgeting uh, approach. In this case, let's have a look at exactly those 11 components, what makes that up. I mean, just for instance, the secondary distribution fee uh, brings in 4 billion rand per annum uh, uh, cost to society. What, well, what is that for? Is it is 4 billion rand required? Secondary storage fee, another 7 billion rand uh, per annum that goes, uh, uh, at, uh, you know, when you look at the 23 billion liters of petrol and diesel uh, pumped uh, per annum. So we need to have a look at these uh, levies all these costs and even the uh, retail margins that have to be paid because there are increases, salary increases to pump jockeys. Uh, we must question that. You know, the days of increases in salaries uh, needs to be questioned uh, throughout all levels of government as well. So there's there's a need because more than half of the uh, the price of petrol now it makes is made up by those 11 uh, other components. 
and we cannot just simply keep sitting back. You must also understand that the that the uh, fuel price 10 years ago, uh, the international fuel price was at $114 a barrel. It's way below that now. Uh, and this is all uh, as a result of poor economic policy as well uh, due to the weak rand. All right. We'll, we'll get into what are the areas of action that can reduce the retail price. But uh, let's uh, uh, take this a little bit further. Jones, uh, what, what is the impact of this high fuel price on the economy? Maybe explain the concept of cost push inflation and what that actually uh, plays out uh, as. Well, um, fuel plays a fairly small part or a relatively small part in the general CPI basket. But when you take a closer look, almost every other item in that basket that makes up for our inflation figures has to be transported in some way or another. So um, the effect of fuel prices are massive. And every South African bears the brunt eventually for all of that. And you know, if we take a closer look at fuel prices, um, Wayne already mentioned that um, the actual wholesale import price of fuel constitutes less than half of the overall retail price. And if we uh, take an even closer look at that, Sassel um, produces fuel at even lower. So, so um, the price regulations that are Sorry, Jens, uh, unfortunately, unfortunately that, 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 that line is a little bit of a challenge. Let's, let's hold it there. Let's try and get you on a better line because I need to get a little bit of that understanding, particularly around the, the blended uh, uh, price that Sasol pays uh, for fuel and, and, and how that comes about. You can unpack that for us a little bit more when we continue next. Do stay with us. You're live with us tonight here on uh, In Focus, News from Africa, Channel 405, the makeup of the fuel price under discussion uh, tonight. And uh, we are, of course, what are, uh, assessing what are the areas of action that could certainly bring that down. If you think you've got a contribution to this and uh, you, you certainly have some suggestions, do send them through 072 110 uh, We'll get into those and uh, try and unpack those with our panel tonight. Otherwise, any questions that you have around the uh, cost of fuel and how it is made up, uh, we'll certainly get those answers for you. Mkulago, as the lawmaker here in, on, 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 on the panel and uh, looking at the high volatility of fuel prices as a permanent feature, basically, if you look from the times uh, of 2008, does this merit a reconsideration of our transport and taxation policies that are in place? Well, it does, <clears throat> because there is no law that is um, linear and one which is outside the daily lived material conditions of the people. Uh, the economy will change, the um, economic fabric will change, and the political um, spectrum in itself will change and move. And therefore, there is a need from time to time to make a reassessment um, of the taxes. Moreover, you'll recall that every year the minister will actually introduce the tax amendment bills to parliament, an indication of the fact that these assessments um, actually should be done. So what should actually be happening now is that the Standing Committee on Finance uh, must actually be taking the lead on this matter to make uh, a reflection and engage with um, stakeholders on what actually should be uh, happening. I think what we must never forget uh, is that Parliament is, is constitutionally entitled and empowered um, to actually make changes to bills that come before Parliament. The fact that since 1994, not one budget has been changed by Parliament and is literally um, rubber stamped it as it has come from the executive is an indictment in itself and speaks to a parliament that fundamentally believe has not strategically taken up its constitutional responsibility and mandate. And we fundamentally believe as the IFP as having raised this matter actually um, some three um, years ago um, as the IFP as well. So we do believe that there is an urgent need um, and urgent is an understatement here because what is actually happening, let me make an example on behalf of the uh, taxi commuters, for an example. The petrol price will go up, right, um, this month and go up next month and probably the next month. And then the taxi operators will then up the taxi fare for traveling, uh, for commuting. 
But that tax effect never goes down when the petrol price goes down. So those are part of the elements of the discussion that we need to have in terms of what we mean by um, looking at the impact of the cost of fuel. So that's the long-term plan, it's gonna take time. What government needs to do now is actually ease off the economic pressure on the population, on the people and suspend the fuel levies. It is not sustainable for the majority of our people. It is not sustainable for business. Um, and we fundamentally believe as the IFP that this will be a missed opportunity. Sometimes it takes a crisis for people to recognize the extent of the responsibility yeah. that they have. These escalating fuel prices are in fact a crisis. Right. Jans, I think we've got you on a better line. Let's, let, let's bring you back here. There's one academic who once suggested uh, this concept uh, that there is something going on, for example, at Sasso, where they are producing oil from coal, which is made locally, uh, and they are producing that uh, oil at 30% cheaper than what they are uh, paying for the imported oil. Uh, so you've got a blend of imported product uh, with local product, yet the price is not cheaper. It stays at, at the same uh, rate. What, what's the reasoning here? Uh, please unmute if you can. Yes, um, people have come up with many different reasons um, for this, but in our um, opinion and according to much of the research that I've done, um, Sassel generally produces um, petrol at the rate of about 60 to 80 percent of what fuel is imported at. So they're making often excessive profits um, at the cost of the general consumer. And um, yeah, what price regulation is actually doing is it's forcing the com consumer to pay excessive prices, on both on the wholesale transport and retail levels, which is why solidarity is um, calling on one hand for the complete deregulation of fuel, uh, which will be a massive campaign for us moving forward. Um, we are currently um, seeking legal advice and we aim to um, take this to court next year because um, in our view, um, the continued regulation of fuel prices is irrational. It's achieving the exact opposite of what it was put in place to achieve, which is to um, provide yeah. cheaper fuel or affordable fuel to consumers. In our view, actually, because of Sassel um, being forced to take excessive profits um, by re um, current price regulations forced upon them by government, um, in our view, it's actually South Africa is the only country in the world artificially manipulating fuel prices to keep them higher than they're supposed to be. So at the, at the risk of sounding like a, an anti-capitalist, which I'm definitely not, if ever you were to look for a collusion between business and state, here's one staring you right in the face. Yeah. Taxes levied on fuel, uh, Leighton, compared to other countries, uh, it, it seems uh, South Africa actually, uh, the, well, government argues pays less, for example, compared to what they are paying in the, in, the, in the UK. Of course, our economies are not the same and uh, they're not, they're not uh, built the same. But uh, they, they, their argument is that, well, compared to what taxes are being levied elsewhere, uh, we actually got it uh, a little bit better here. I think a comparison with the uh, global North countries uh, with South Africa is, is wholly inappropriate on every level. I don't think it uh, serves any purpose at all, and it fails to take into account the uh, special circumstances that South Africa has. So um, any comparison that's made with a country such as the UK, I think, misses the mark completely. Um, I think from our point of view, we are a little bit puzzled at the reticence of the government to actually embark on a process that may, at the end of it, uh, deal with the, with the rising fuel costs. Um, you know, uh, we have to question why there is such resistance to doing that when it could, at the end of the day, lead to uh, better prices for people at the pumps. Um, that's the first issue. The, the issue of taxes is an extremely controversial issue. Um, and, you know, both uh, Tians and Mr. Klingwa have, have noted that this is an issue, as has Wayne. Um, 
the, the question always comes up, well, if you take the general Q levy out of the equation, it's an easy tax for government to collect. It brings in around about 110 billion rand a year to the fiscus. If you take that out of the picture, where does government replace, or what does government replace that with? Where are they going to get that 110 billion rand? And that, unfortunately, brings into question all these issues about spending and about accountability and about graft and corruption. And is that 110 billion rand actually spent correctly? And this is why questions around the fuel price are raised time and time again. One final point that I want to make on this, uh, and Mr. Klingwell mentioned this as well, when the price goes up, um, everything goes up along with it, but when the price comes down, uh, nothing happens. If the price does come down below 20 Rand, this is an issue that may fall off the radar for a couple of months until it's back over 20 Rand again, and that's a huge issue. If the fuel price is anything over 16 or 15 or 14 Rand, it's a problem for all South Africans. And this is something that we think, uh, no matter what the fuel price is, even if it's at 10 rand a litre, it's something that we need to review to ensure that every element that is in there is supposed to be on there and is calculated correctly and is in the interests of consumers, not in the interests of government. So, Wayne, what are those fixed um, uh, elements right now that make up that 20 rands uh, per litre that we are currently paying? All right, you're, you're muted there, Wayne. Sorry, if you, if you can unmute for us. Sorry. <clears throat> Sorry, yeah, the big one is the fuel levy at 3 Rand 83 cents a litre. And, and just uh, 10 years ago, that was uh, 1 Rand 78 cents a litre. So that's gone up 116%, well above inflation. And then if you look at the road accident front from 80 cents to 2 Rand uh, 18 cents in a decade, 173% uh, uh, increase. And the others, when you throw them in. So combined, all those levies go up 126%. Uh, in a decade, go and look at inflation compounded. It comes out to around about 65%. So government keeps milking this, and you don't notice it. So every year in February, the, uh, the, the uh, Treasury and, and, and the Minister of Finance announces increases to these levies, and it's 20 cents here and 30 cents there, uh, and, and more on the road accident fund, which is another debacle all on its own, where government just keeps throwing money at this pot, which is grossly mismanaged and corruptly spent. Uh, so we've got to fix that as well. And this just adds up. So now we are in a very tough situation, and we're asking government, we've written to the Minister of Finance to say this year, we're not asking you to scrap the levy, just do not increase it, not one yeah. cent, and neither the road, road accident, but all of them. Let's take a break on this incessant, continuous above inflation increases and go and clean your house out, uh, as, as Leighton was saying. The money is lying in pots. It's this bucket with holes in it. Go and plug those holes. You'll find more than enough money to make up the uh, differences that you won't get from these increases if you just do so and listen to the people. What If you've got nothing to hide, then you need to engage with society to find the solutions. We want to work with you to find the solutions. Otherwise, we will continue to accuse you of being untransparent and, and, and doing things that are not in the best interest of society. Can, can, can we afford to uh, take away? I mean, I, I believe there are countries that don't pay those levies uh, and don't pay, for example, the RAF. Uh, hence, uh, people are asking, why would the petrol be cheaper in Botswana than it is here in, in, in South Africa, for example? Well, you know, I don't think uh, you, we, you know, we, the government's come to uh, um, lean heavily on those taxes. As Blayton mm -hmm. says, you add just the fuel levy and the road accident fund, you're talking about 150 billion rand a year. You can't take those away now. Uh, but what you can do is start looking into the future and, and, and releasing the pressure by not increasing them. And you must remember governments think in five years' terms, and the damage that they've done over the last 10 years is going to impact for a long time. And when electric vehicles come, they've got an even bigger problem because they're relying on taxes based on fossil fuels. And uh, yes, one might say you're going to put an electricity price. I don't think that's going to happen because electricity is just grossly overpriced. So they've got a problem uh, from, uh, from, from all fronts. And uh, they need to start thinking long term. They need to engage with civil society. And together yep. we need to find the solutions, not this arrogant attitude that uh, they can just continue doing it the way they have been doing. And that's why uh, I think the next elections are going to be very, very interesting because they have uh, they've just forgotten about the people, quite frankly.
I think at this point it's important that I also do uh, let our viewers know that we did reach out to government to be a part of this panel conversation uh, tonight. Uh, they are, of course, uh, uh, at this particular point not uh, uh, forwarding anyone to come and have this conversation with us. Uh, so uh, we will continue until they do have somebody to come and talk to us. Uh, but uh, that is at this particular point the answer that we got from them. Let's hear your views. 072 110 the high volatility of the fuel price, uh, are there certain permanent actions that you think can be uh, taken or even temporary actions that you think can be taken to reduce that price of fuel? We'll continue with your views when we come back. Live with us tonight on In Focus News of Africa, Channel 405. Thanks for staying on. The conversation continues. Leighton Beard and Clever Schlemmer, Jens de Bosson, as well as Wayne Duvenage are part of the conversation tonight. And of course, we're taking your views on 072-110-5584. Now, Clever, you've already mentioned that uh, these taxis and levies are brought to Parliament every year. In fact, the Department of Mineral Resources is saying, well, we actually don't put these on. They are decided in Parliament. They just merely pass them on to us and we, and we add them uh, as, 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 as a number. I mean, the opaqueness around the allocation and utilization of the general fuels levy, is that deliberate? Well, I think there is a heightened level of dishonesty in terms of how government does things um, in this regard. And as I was saying that our immediate crisis is a parliament that is not mm -hmm. taking up its constitutional rightful place um, in these matters and simply accepting what the executive and specifically national treasury will bring before the house. And we have a so-called public participation and public hearings exercise which is largely cosmetic as opposed to being real. And therefore that is wherein lies the danger because this has become a runaway train um, over the years. <clears throat> Issues have been raised day in and day out in parliament, but if you do not have the majority, of course, you are not going to um, succeed. We raised this matter very sharply um, in July, August, 2018, precisely because the petrol prices were actually shooting through the roof then. So here the onus largely sits um, with parliament, but specifically the standing committee on finance and the standing committee on appropriations who are actually hands on in so far as um, the budgeting process in parliament is concerned. And I am, the IFP is making a call um, and a challenge to those committees to step up and to actually credibly listen uh, to what um, civil society and the general public um, are putting before them. Any other explanation, what the Department of Mineral Resources is telling you is the highest level of obfuscation. And in fact, with one of the jokes um, of the year, they are party um, to these determinations because ultimately the budget comes from cabinet and they would have made representations. Departments all make representations um, to, the to the budget process. The biggest link here is Parliament. Wayne, uh, uh, what are the alternatives here as far as, um, for example, if we were to uh, look at uh, weaning South Africa of reliance on, on, on fuel? Well, on fuel, um, I mean, that's going to happen uh, whether we like it or not. Uh, manufacturers overseas uh, in the next, uh, this decade, many of them, most of them are not going to be making fuel-driven cars. So, but fuel is a source of energy and whether it comes from solar uh, charging batteries, which will charge your car or Eskom doing that, that, that mix is going to change uh, fundamentally. And when you start talking about the whole energy mix, uh, the integrated energy plan that the, that the Department of Minerals and Energies has to put together, which they are very slow at doing and, and not updating it fast enough, which is why we're behind the curve. So for now, you know, we will rely heavily on, 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 on petrol and diesel, but, but that's not going to always be the case. And I think government uh, needs to start taking a longer term approach and view on these matters. Already our electric vehicle policy, by the way, is way behind a country like Kenya. And that's a sad situation to be. We led this continent when it came to uh, vehicle, vehicle production, manufacturing, exporting. Uh, we're going to fall behind very quickly and lose jobs and lose out on this new transition into new energy. So, yeah, but for now, it's still petrol and it will be for the next five years or so until it starts to wean off. Yeah. 
Tian, so one of the areas of action here, I mean, they're saying there are two particular uh, places we can look at. We've already expanded a little bit on the one uh, around the retail price of fuel. But what can we do to increase fuel efficiency? Because that's another area uh, that we could certainly uh, uh, look at that would help us. Mm -hmm. Sorry, Jens, you're, you're muted there. Yes, first of all, we can actually um, start by voting out this government that um, does not care about the people on the ground level and does not understand the economics and where they do, they simply don't care um, because the fuel situation that we currently have has no relevance to reality whatsoever. I mean, even um, countries that are officially communist countries such as Vietnam no longer as strictly govern fuel prices as the South African government does. And I hear what Wayne is saying about the future being electric, and I fully agree. I mean, we can't escape that. But for the year and now, people are driving vehicles that are reliant on fuel uh, um, being petrol and diesel. And um, for the year and now, I mean, we just come out of the um, third quarter um, with negative growth. We need to awaken this economy of South Africa. And, uh, and all the government is doing is further straggling what's left of the economy. And a great starting place would be affordable fuel. Kickstart this um, economy of ours, get things going again. But, yeah, well, feels like we're um, talking in an echo chamber and the government just aren't interested in um, lightening the burden on the people on the street. I mean, if it's come to this um, that we're um, asking how we as individuals can um, lift this burden on ourselves, then we've already reached a point where there's um, not much hope, to be honest. Yeah. Uh, Listen, on, on, on fuel efficiency, I mean, is there, is there something that could be done? Because, I mean, obviously part of what, what is a, a challenge now, for example, in South Africa, is the over-reliance on uh, road transport as opposed to rail transport. And therefore that, uh, in, in essence, means we're paying more uh, uh, for everything that comes on our table and everything that we, we wear and so on and so forth, because it has to be transported on the road, and that has got to mm -hmm. lose fuel. Yeah, it's like you were reading my mind, Tom, because I've been chomping at the bit to use the word transnet, uh, I think, for the last 20 minutes. And uh, I think when we made our uh, presentation to Parliament in March, where we were asked by the DMRE to give our views on how we could mitigate against rising fuel costs. And by the way, uh, we mentioned all of the things that we're mentioning here tonight, along with what everybody else has said. And at the time also said, let's review the fuel price. But sadly, at the time, the most important thing um, that many of the MPs were concerned about was where we sourced the data. Um, and I think that gives you an indication of where the thinking is. But yes, I think in terms of the alternatives, certainly we've got to make Transnet a whole lot more efficient than what it is at the moment. Uh, I think there is a huge opportunity to make us less reliant on road freight through um, the better management of our rail network in South Africa. That's critically important. Uh, the second thing is we need to look at how we improve the condition of the roads in South Africa, because that's really important and critical uh, to the free flow of goods across the country. So that's uh, um, equally important. Uh, and then thirdly, um, just from a consumer point of view, which is where the AA um, situates itself uh, most, is the fact that we need affordable, reliable, safe, sustainable public transport. And we don't have that in South Africa. Um, it's either unsafe or expensive, or um, it's uh, just not efficient. So, you know, there's a whole raft of things. I've given three examples. I'm sure um, if, if everybody on this, uh, on this call were to spend an hour together, we could probably come up with about 20 different things. So um, it's all a question of let's engage. And um, civil society um, is ready. We're waiting. We want to be engaged. We've given our views. We're very public about the fact that we think th these things need to happen. Um, we'd like to see this review. We'd like it to be transparent. Again, we don't understand why there's so much reticence to do this, so much resistance. Um, you know, it's just a question of let's get it done and see where we end up. I mean, it, what harm could it do, basically? Yeah. And Kulago, I mean, on that score, uh, your, your biggest concern, of course, are the poor who have to commute. So efficient, low-cost transport, quite essential, particularly in the bigger agenda to achieve economic integration and strengthening uh, the, the, the competitiveness uh, of the country. What are the suggestions around that particular aspect of things? 
Well, there, there's quite a lot of them, but you also have to look at the needs um, of the commuter and who the who you're talking to. And so this is why you need to have a multi-sectoral approach to this. You've got a housing um, problem in, in, in universities and institutions of higher learning, and therefore students have to travel. So the Department of Higher Education and Training and Society needs to be working with the Department of Transport on easing the cost for students um, to move around. You've got um, heightened unemployment in this country, close to 10 million people. These people are commuting mm -hmm. to work. How are they um, to find work rather? How are they commuting when it's so expensive? <clears throat> the other issue is that, the, and maybe to use the, what may now be a catchphrase for lack of a better term is to say, government's job is to create a conducive and enabling environment for businesses to operate. These fuel, high fuel costs are not conducive. Um, they are a deterrent to investment. They are counterproductive. Um, yeah. And in the long run, what they are going to do is they are robbing us an opportunity of sustainable development and inching us closer and closer to a state of dependency and one of social grants with a shrinking tax base. So the contradictions are so glaring that the interventions are urgent. And so what you really need to do here is reforms in terms of infrastructure development and reforms to spatial planning for the movement of people. And you need to create better beneficiation, agro-processing realities um, in so far as the movement of food um, is concerned. <clears throat> you are looking at a situation um, whereby a very frank discussion needs to be had with the taxi industry in this country in so far as building in regulations about ensuring that the state derives maximum uh, uh, you, you know, dividends out of its presence in so far as the social project of the movement of people is concerned. And then finally, <clears throat> there has to be a drastic change in so far as the movement of logistics is concerned. The fact that the N3 between Durban and Johannesburg has got more trucks than any of us have ever seen, and there is no movement of these goods on trains is an added burden and an added risk um, to the um, transport sector because the one, of course, <clears throat> is the issue around accidents, and that's why then there's a reliance on the road accident fund because the roads are in a terrible state and so on. So <clears throat> there has to be a radical shift alongside many different variables um, in this regard in order for you then to say the transportation reality on its own can't be dependent just on fuel, but on other disciplines and policy intervention. I think the final point I want to make is earlier on I missed a word. I really wanted to say that the biggest, weakest link in this entire discussion is parliament. I hear you there. That's um, Kulego Shenga. We'll continue in a moment and take your thoughts. 072-110-5584. When we come back, some other suggestions coming from the Automobile Association on how to reduce the road accident fund. Of course, they're saying we are being really taxed so that uh, there is money available should there be accidents on the roads, but we are not doing anything to reduce those accidents on the road. So what is it that uh, certainly uh, can be done to deal with that? Your suggestions and your comments tonight on 072-110-5584. We're back in a moment. Welcome back. You're live with us tonight on In Focus News Zoom Africa Channel 405 and the conversation around the makeup of our uh, fuel price. It's a permanent feature now. Uh, certainly the volatility of the fuel price certainly going up and now reaching 20 rands per litre as we come into this festive season. One of the toughest uh, things that you're going to have to contend with is of course the cost to travel to the various destinations that uh, you will be uh, getting to. Now, uh, Leighton, part of the suggestions that you have put uh, to Parliament is of course that the road accident fund can be reduced. How? I think uh, almost everybody on this call tonight has uh, referred to the poor state of the RAF and the need for that institution to be reformed in some way. Um, you made reference to the fact earlier that there is a heavy reliance on the RAF and that obviously is contributing to the burden uh, that consumers have to pay through the RAF levy. Uh, and that's something that we think um, needs to be rectified urgently, either through uh, wholly privatizing the RAF or, or semi-privatizing it or dealing privately with the claims management process of the RF, something needs to happen. 
But that brings us back to another question of why we are so reliant on the RAF. And that's because the RTMC, whose core function is road safety and promoting road safety in South Africa, is not doing their job. Um, their CEO earns uh, remuneration close to 10 million rand a year. Um, and the uh, institution itself gets qualified audits and is told by the Auditor General that they do not uh, work within the framework of auditing principles. Uh, yet we don't see a meaningful reduction in the number of road deaths or road crashes on our roads annually. Um, you know, in 2020, we are now hearing that COVID was the silver bullet that brought road deaths and fatalities down. Well, yeah, of course it did because there were fewer cars on the road. So, um, you know, let's look at what the situation is in 2021 and 2022. The bottom line is, is that we are a country that has extremely poor road safety. We have too many people who die on our roads annually and nothing meaningful gets done about it. And because of that, we have this reliance on the RAF um, and they are in such a poor state themselves um, that it's just a vicious cycle that's repeating itself. Um, you want to ask me why we need a review of the fuel price? Well, there's the first and most important reason why we do. Let's relook at the RAF. And by the way, let's look at all where, let's look at where all the other money that's going towards taxes is being spent. That's a good place to start. Yeah. Kuna Gutlang, are they suggesting that, for example, uh, a holistic approach around infrastructure, uh, uh, around the building of roads, around, uh, but also ensuring, for example, that houses are built uh, closer to where people work? I mean, you're saying the general fuels levy would be better allocated uh, to, to, to provide for such? Yes, of course. If, if we are going to continue having the general fuels levy, then we need to ring fence it and redirect it towards um, areas where it is uh, supposed to be making an impact. Um, if it is about transportation and the movement of people, then the development uh, must arise out of that uh, uh, levy. It can't just be a willy-nilly uh, free-for-all uh, a levy that does not actually make a meaningful impact in the area in which <clears throat> it is collected. That's the first point. The second one is that if we continue having the fewer levies <clears throat> without a program of action at the very least and a policy outlook, um, which is going to ensure that we see development, we are literally creating a dependency syndrome, which says no matter what happens in the country, we've got no problem because there is a stream of revenue that is going to come in. So there has to be conditionalities attached to it in order for it to be meaningful. Um, I mean, if I were to make a very extreme um, example, it's like tithing in church and not seeing where the tithes are going. They may improve the life of the, the priest and he's got a luxurious car and so on and so forth. What it should actually be doing is that the money being generated through these levies um, actually have to be focused. The second and final point is this. Financial management in all the government entities has already been alluded to, consistent with the law, specifically the NPA, has to be a key focus priority. Prasa is a mess, and so people are bound to then to move um, to, 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 to taxis um, and buses. You, the road accident fund is a mess, and the ripple effect, of course, of accidents is the added strain it does to hospitals and on the healthcare sector and the cost to repair the roads. So this all becomes a, you know, a domino effect, and unless we nip it in the bud and take away the easy reliance, the low-hanging fruit to say, to hell with everything else, money will still come in is fundamentally where, where the problem um, actually resides. So there is an absolute need um, that one, we reassess the, the levies, but also at the same time, be very stringent about why they should exist and where that money should go. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's a, it's a controversial one that you're raising, but uh, one nonetheless that is out there that has been uh, uh, touted about. Can we pump our own fuel? I mean, with the unemployment rate in the country right now, I don't think that it is something that we really want to talk about. But you're talking about, for example, increases to the wages of the uh, petrol pump attendants. I don't know if that will pass. Yeah, look, um, the, you know, I think we are a little bit different to overseas. Overseas, you pump your own fuel and you don't have those costs. But I don't think they have our problems yet. The amount of hijackings at petrol pump stations will go up. 
And, uh, and yes, so we are creating through the levies that are paid protected employment. Uh, but that all is a, an outcome of government policy uh, and, and the inability to manage crime and, and so forth. So I guess there'd be higher costs in petrol stations to have guards, for instance. Uh, so it's a quite a complex discussion. But the, I think the real issue uh, is, is, has been raised by, by uh, uh, Mr. Tlengo with regards to this lack of focus on public transport. The mm. process, it's a sin to see what's happened. And then for the minister to remove people like Martha and Goya and others who are exposing the corruption and maladministration in Prasa. <clears throat> and, and now we have a failed Prasa, failed uh, a, a system of, uh, a, and a very strong and, and reliable, once reliable uh, public transport system, which has is, which is collapsed. And uh, uh, we, we haven't paid enough attention to that. And I think it was uh, Enrico Penalosa, the mayor of Bogota, once said that, you know, the sign of a developed society is not is not when the rich, uh, when the poor drive cars to work. It's when the rich use public transport, and that's what we've got to get our minds around. We've got to get the spatial development right. We've got to improve our public transport to reduce this reliance uh, on, on 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 owning vehicles and 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 having all these other things and and, and costs that come with it. Uh, the the Department of Transport has been on this ac- a decade of action to try and get the death rates under control. Uh, they've done nothing, nothing. We've had seven ministers of, of transport in the last uh, ten uh, decade or so. It's just crazy, and and nothing gets done. So the short term thinking, uh, lack of long term planning, and as Mr. Flengua says, there's just reliance. Well, you know, we'll just tax them again in in, in February, and uh, they're soft targets, and they'll come running and paying. Well, that that train has now run out, and this government has to start thinking very differently. And if they don't do something now in the next two years, I don't think they'll find themselves in power. Tians, a quick one from you as we wrap up. What can be done to stop the high oil or fuel prices from derailing our economic growth? Well, um, we can, of course, um, go over to electric and all of that, but that just brings new costs. Um, So from the individual side, I mean, you can um, switch to a more fuel-efficient car, but... Once again, why is the ball being put into the consumer's court? Um, some two things that can immediately be done is the fuel levy, drought accident fund levy can be reduced and petrol can be deregulated. Because I mean, you and your local fuel station owner um, know better what the realistic price of fuel would be than the state does. So yeah, that's two things that can immediately be done. And then um, the alternatives to road transport needs to be expanded. It needs to be um, kept, the upkeep needs to be done. Because the upkeep on roads are also, except for the few national roads, not being done. But we have no other choice but to take our chances on these dysfunctional roads. Rail is dysfunctional. Um, air transport is just unaffordable for the for most of us. So um, you know, serious overall, not only of the fuel um, price and um, the road conditions is necessary, but transport in general, all of it needs to be changed, has to be looked at and has to be reformed. Appreciate your time, gentlemen, and thank you very much uh, for joining us tonight. Quick look at some of the WhatsApp messages uh, coming through to the conversation tonight and your reaction and your comments. From Peter in uh, Maboning saying, the current government is dishonest, arrogant, and doesn't care about the ordinary citizens. Fuel prices should uh, be at 10 rents per litre. Right now, people are suffocating. Come next election, the current government will be history. The people of South Africa have had enough. Bricks uh, Lingwane in the CD being saying, I think this is pure daylight robbery by the government or motorists. Government uh, perceives motorists as cash cows as well as vulnerable and easy pickings. Those are some of your thoughts tonight. I appreciate it. And thank you very much uh, for sending those through. 072-110-558 for important number where uh, you get your voice uh, onto the show. And of course, uh, your questions and your comments. Big thanks to Leighton Beard and Kulego Tlengwa, Dianz Dibosan, as well as Wayne Dubin.